Uh, my husband Frank and I, we have been married for 29 years, I think, and we have six kids, 28 down to, um, gosh, 18, 28 to 18. We have four girls and two boys. And then we're so grateful that for Christmas, everybody came home, saw all six kids were home, and it was awesome. My dryer broke. Uh, yeah, which is a great combination with the stomach flu and broken dryer. Mm, didn't go well, uh, but uh, got through it. And my new dryer came yesterday, so woo, life is good. Uh, but um, I, I'm so grateful that I get to be here teaching the theology of the body. I shared with the first class that um, I was doing youth ministry at my parish at St. Mary's in Hudson, and I was um, asked to do the teaching on marriage. And I got up to teach, and I realized that um, it was just like I had too many questions than answers myself. And I, I literally like kind of broke out in highs when the priest asked me to like teach on marriage. And um, and I went in with like big tears coming down my cheeks, and I said um, that um, the the difficulty of teaching teenagers is that they can totally see right through you, right? They can sense authenticity. And I thought, I can't stand up in front of these teenagers if I'm not even sure if I agree with what the church says on marriage. And so um, I, I said to him, I'm going to quit. I'm going to walk away for a time. I'm going to like resort through everything and then make a decision about coming back. And I think you guys met Father Damien Ferentz. Um, he was one of the earlier speakers. And um, thank you so much. So um, anyways, he said to me, um, Jen, Christianity isn't about figuring it all out and then joining. He said, Christianity is um, a lifelong journey of learning. And if you're willing to walk with me, then I'll walk with you. And then he just started giving me books and articles on the church teachings that I doubted. And as I started to kind of read into them more, I was like, oh, wow, the church has a really good point here. <laughs> like, I see what the church is saying here. I'm like, wow, the church is super consistent, you know? And then slowly but surely, I was like, okay. Okay, okay. And then finally one day I was like, oh my gosh, maybe, just maybe this 2,000-year-old church knows more than me, you know? And um, it sounds kind of strange, but I, I honestly can say that I kind of like fell in love with our church. And with that, I not only um, decided to go off and get a certification from the Theology Body Institute, which is an organization outside of Philly, and I went through like eight courses with them. But I also went to the seminary and got a master's degree in theology. Um, my husband base is like, Jen, okay, you've been a stay-at-home mom for like many years, and you realize we have six kids, and you realize you can't keep being a volunteer like forever. And so that's why I went and got the credentials. But you guys know we do it for the money, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, I was like driving here, and I... I got this text, and I'm like, okay, I think I'm supposed to share this story. So I'm going to start off with a story about something that recently happened um, that kind of ties in with this um, main, I main idea for today. But um, basically, um, I had one of these days where, I mean, our house was like it was an older house and like really, really needed windows for like years and years. Like half the windows in our house wouldn't even open, okay? And we kept getting the window guy, because, you know, they're pretty, re like, they just don't give up, right? And they're knocking on your door, knocking on your door. And we'd book the guy. He'd come do his thing and, like, show us the total. And we'd be like, hell no, you know? We're like, I can't do that. And the poor guy would be sent on his way. And we kept doing it. And it got old and it got annoying. And I remember I got home from work this one day, and my husband's like, so, honey, like, the window guy's coming. I'm like, are you kidding? I think I had, like, mashed potatoes, like, in, um almost done and I knew this was going to take a while and I was tired and I was hungry and I was grumpy and I did not want a meeting with the window guy probably also because I knew it wasn't going to end well because we weren't going to get the window because no one has that kind of money right and um anyway so um the guy comes and as soon as he gets there he kind of looks at me and he's like oh your husband told me you work for the church now I think to myself, oh no, here we go. Now I'm going to have to talk about God on top of everything else. <laughs> and again, I was not in the mood. Um, but at some point in the conversation, the guy like looked me right in the eye and he said, I used to go to church. And I just whispered to the Lord, I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> if you want me to enter into some sort of dialogue with this guy, I'll do it. 
And I gave the smallest, tiniest, half-hearted yes. And it ended up being one of my most favorite, most beautiful God conversations I've ever had. By the end of the conversation, he shared with me about his own parents' divorce, about his um, dad's um, death years later, about this tattoo about God he had imprinted on his chest. And, and he left there with the bulletin. And he's like, ah, I'm going to come to Mass. You know? It was so cool. So the next day when I go to work, I decide to tell my women's group that story. Because I wanted them to know that when you're tired, hungry, grumpy, crabby, all of that stuff, and you give God this tiniest, littlest, half-hearted yes, he can do amazing things. So I wanted to share that story with them. So I tell them the whole story about, it was uh, Dominic the window guy, um, and how we ended up, and at the end of the story, they're like, did you get the windows? <laughs> like, yes, we got the windows, <laughs> on top of everything else. So, so anyways, I, I, tell, I tell that story to my women's group the next morning. A week later, I get a call from one of the women who was in that group that morning. She goes, can you meet me at your office? I have a favor. I'm like, sure, no problem. And then we get there, and like, so it was a half an hour before class was beginning, and she asked to go meet in my office, and, um, and then we get down there, and she closes the door. And then I'm like, oh, no, what's going on? What does she need? Whatever. And now I'm kind of like on edge, whatever. She goes, I, I have a favor, and I already talked to Father Ryan. You guys, some of you guys know Father Ryan. From, yeah, he um, is uh, at my my nonprofit is on his campus at St. Basil the Great in Brexville. So um, this was at St. Basil where this was happening at my office, and um, and she goes, I already talked to Father Ryan. He said you're not going to be offended um, for, about the favor that I have to ask you. And I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking, what is she going to ask me? <laughs> and she says, um, I have a favor. I need you to let me buy your windows for you. I need you to let me buy your windows for it. She, and I was just like, I was in shock. I was like, I started crying. And then I said, uh, yes. <laughs> um, and she goes, Father Ryan told me you were going to do that. Father Ryan told me you were going to say you're overwhelmed, and then you're going to cry, and then you say yes. <laughs> um, but it, it, it seriously happened. She's like, I don't want you to have to worry about windows. I want you to do ministry. You know, like I said, we're in it for the money, right? And this was one of, the, <laughs> one of the gifts that came. But the cool little kind of footnote, and then, and then I'm going to tell you the final story at the end of the talk today. But um, here's the cool little footnote. Um, I could not wait to get home to tell my husband that this woman was making a gift to us of $20,000 and was buying our windows for us. And um, when I got home, um, my husband and my son were sitting there, and I told them the whole story. I was so happy that my son got to hear a story of someone with such incredible generosity, right? So I'm telling them the story, and the class that we were in at the time was studying St. Edith Stein. And um, so I end the story um, by talking about these windows, and I'm like, Anne, it's, it's the, the cool thing about it is that it's St. Edith Stein's feast day. And my son looks at me, my 18-year-old, he's like, Mom, it's not St. Edith Stein's feast day. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like, I'm sorry, you're right, her feast day's tomorrow. He's like, yeah, because today is the feast day of St. Dominic. And I was like, what? So not only, God just wanted to put a little exclama ah, exclamation point on the end. So I got this unbelievable gift from this random Dominic the window guy, but it came on the feast day mm -hmm. of St. Dominic. Um, and so just yesterday, my windows got installed. So isn't that amazing? This amazing story of generosity. So, um, to get us in the whole idea of the body and, and the recognition of the goodness and the beauty of the body, I gave you guys a handout. I want you to glance through that handout really quick. I want you to take a moment. I want you to think of the joy of Christmas 2023. I want you to think of some of the most amazing things that you saw, that you smelled, are you thinking of them right now? That you tasted? That you heard? That you touched? That you did? I'm thinking of like activities, like move your body around. Are you thinking of some of those things? Okay, share one of them with the person next to you. Share one of those things, one of those awesome things that you tasted, smelled, saw, touched, whatever. <laughs> What is you? 
Is there an extra? No, I need to share. Okay, so do you mind sharing? Tell one person share. What's one thing you saw beautiful or great? Let me hear. What'd you see? Go, Tannis. Sure. Um, a beautiful uh, lit Christmas Lit Christmas, <laughs> yeah. No, and Christmas market. We Christmas market? Yeah, we were in Austria. So. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. That's so cool. Someone give me a good smell. Let me hear it. The trees. Oh, I love it. Anyone else still have the tree up? <laughs> me too. Mine still smells good. I love it. Okay, what's well, a good taste? Uh, Kathleen, say yours. Oh, um, lasagna. Homemade lasagna. With pepperoni. With pepperoni in it. Mm. We had homemade manicotti for the first time. It was so good. Okay, what about herd? Anyone go to any concerts? Concert, what'd you go to? Cleveland Orchestra. You went to the orchestra? How amazing. What a gift that we have that, right? That's awesome. What about touch? You want to have a story of... Go ahead. We should film the principal. No. <laughs> she put you on the spot. Yeah, I touched Cheer. the weight. It's beautiful. I touched the weight. You did? Yeah, on the ocean. You did? Touch the wave in the ocean? Yeah. He was at the beach for Christmas wow. with his family. I love that. That's amazing. Thank you. I, I haven't been to the beach in so long someday. That's awesome. Okay, and then did. Who wants to share something they did? Anything? Anyone go ice skating? Sledding? Ski? Okay, yeah, you did. Austria. So maybe go home and fill this out with your kids, right? Fill out and have them think like about the whole experience of the whole body and how you take in the sights, the smells, the taste, the touch, the noise, the, the everything, right? It's a recognition of how God gifted us as human beings with all of this sense, sensory activities, right? What a gift. What a gift that God gave us. So I was reflecting on this on um, topic of this is my body given for you and um, I was thinking about how it would tie it all into the theology of the body and I wanted to first start with the thesis statement of the theology of the body so John Paul II is the author of theology of the body he wrote this teaching in 79 to 84 and the reason he wrote this teaching is because he saw some missteps that were happening in the world that people weren't appreciating the true goodness and beauty of the human body created by God in his image and likeness. And that was in 79 to 84. Little did he know, or maybe he did know <laughs> prophetically, the, the missteps that we're going to take and that we're even like denying that your body has any meaning at all, right? And so his teaching says this, or this is the thesis statement, the body and only the body is capable of making visible what is invisible. So our concrete existing bodies that you can touch, right? They make visible something invisible. So what is that invisible thing? It is the mystery hidden in God. Okay, it was created to transfer it into the reality of the world, this mystery of God. So if you could sum up the mystery of God in one word, what might you say? That God is man. Say again? God is man. God became man, without a doubt. But God is what? Think of some words. God is love. I heard that out there. God is love. That's probably the best one, right? God is love. Um, and so this one mystery of God is, is, is wrapped up in the very way we begin every prayer. In fact, we didn't pray, did we? We might as well. In the name of the... Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord God, send forth your Holy Spirit on us in a special way tonight. Help me to be a good teacher. Help me to enter into this, um, this encounter with you. Give me the ability, Lord, to share these truths of theology of the body with these awesome young um, families and parents and parishioners. 
so that through the experience of tonight, Lord, we can, can come to know you better, understand who we are, and be able to share you more with each other, everyone that you've encountered or entrusted to us in our lives. And let's pray together. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Okay, so what is that mystery of God that God is love? So this is depicted in this icon of the Trinity that, again, we, we start every prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So is our God one or three? <laughs> yes. <laughs> our God is one God in three persons, right? So our God is this one God giving and receiving of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is where we come from. We come from love itself, right? So the Father pouring his love out to the Son, the Son receiving that love and returning it. The love between them is so great. We believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son, right? This is who our God is. And our God, loved by its very nature, it wants to expand, right? It wants to create. It wants to grow. And so this is why God chose to bring humanity into existence, because love wants to expand. It created. God created us, male and female, in his image and likeness. And, um, and in the Genesis story, it says, you know, it's not good for the man to be alone. Why? Because the purpose of life is to learn how to love. And the man had nobody to love, right? And so here we see in this moment, he sees that the male body doesn't make sense alone. The female body doesn't make sense alone. But in light of the other bodies, they can see that they're meant to give, right? They're meant to give and receive and give and receive. And as the man and the woman are giving and receiving and giving and receiving of love, what sometimes can happen? Ta-da! <laughs> this is a beautiful story of my friend Anna and Owen. They got married and they were struggling with infertility. They were so sad they wanted to grow their family and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they did a bunch of novenas to St. Trez of Lisieux. And guess when this little one was born? October 1st, St. Trez's Feast Day, and her name is Zelly. You guys know what Zelly is? Her mom. Yeah, her mom is Zelly. Beautiful. And the good thing about this is, do you see the imagery here? This eternal exchange of divine love becomes visible in the world in this ex eternal exchange of human love, right? This is a beautiful picture, and luckily for us, Family life is so beautiful and simple and neat and tidy all the time, right? <laughs> Anyone have um, a challenging family life over Christmas break? Okay. <laughs> Remember I mentioned the stomach flu and the no dryer and all that? Um, but no, it's, it's, it's beautiful and good and messy and difficult to get along. Sometimes we want marriage and it doesn't come. Sometimes we get married and it falls apart. Sometimes we stop talking to people for no reason, and sometimes for very good reasons, right? Um, I was talking about this, this love of marriage and family life, and a friend of mine said, oh, that's nice for you, John. You know, you have a, hu a husband and kids. He's like, I never got married, and I always wanted to be married. And um, while we were talking, I, I felt like kind of like I could go here with him, and I said, you know what, Tony, though? I bet God has placed a lot of people in your life in need of your love. The next morning, he texts me, and he said, thank you for our conversation la last night, because it changed my worldview. He was stuck in thinking about what he didn't have, and he forgot to think about what he did have. God gives a lot of us a lot of people to love, and it's just a question of whether or not we're open to let him draw us into especially those relationships which are harder to love, right? Right? We all have them. In fact, the reason God puts hard people in our lives to love is because he wants us to grow in our ability to love. It's the most loving thing he can do, <laughs> right? You guys with me? <laughs> okay, so, um, and you know what? And they're struggling again with infertility. 
So if you don't mind keeping them in prayer, Anna and Owen, they're a beautiful couple. So what I decided to do is I was thinking about this quote, this is my body given for you. And we hear that as Annette said in the, in the prayer, the, uh, the Eucharistic prayer. And I found this picture of John Paul II. And I thought to myself, okay, he just received the Eucharist. And here he is looking at the Eucharist in the tabernacle. And I've heard it said that you can never say to the Lord, I love you. The only thing you could ever say to the Lord is, I love you too. <laughs> because we love because he first loved us. So as I was sitting with that, I got this idea, well then, I bet John Paul II, kneeling there in front of the Eucharist, could say to Jesus, this is my body given for you too. Right? And so I thought, let's do that tonight. So tonight for tonight's talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine us saying this back to the Lord. Okay? So maybe think of yourself as kneeling right next to John Paul, looking out at the tabernacle, and, and imagining the meaning of these words. This is my body given up for you. Does that sound good? Maybe it'll have a good deeper insight into how we, we respond to the outpouring of God's love. And the reason I think that we can do this is because of this mystery. The mystery of the incarnation, right? It's only the fact that our God, our all-powerful, all-knowing, eternal God, creator of the universe, chose to make himself finite, step into time, and take on human flesh, this mystery then gives us the ability to know what it means to be human, to then try our whole, the meaning of our whole lives is to imitate Christ, right? Christ who gave himself for us. So now our mission is to figure out how God wants us to give ourselves back to him, right? This is our calling, okay? So um, on, on your paper there, if you could, let's go ahead and read this quote. Actually, can someone read it nice and loud so you don't hear my voice the whole time? Go ahead. The, the incarnation of the Son of God attests one. Sorry, this is one. Please. <laughs> the incarnation of the Son of God attests that God goes in search of man. It is a search which begins in the heart of God. If God goes in search of man, created in His own image and likeness, He does so because He loves him eternally in the Word and wishes to raise him in Christ dignity of an adopted son. God therefore goes in search of man who is his special possession in a way unlike any other creature. Beautiful. Have you thought of yourself as God's special possession? Do you think of yourself as God particularly loving you? Him seeing you, him doting on you, when you do things, he's like, oh, that was so cute the way you did that. <laughs> I love how you did that. I watched you. Mm. I remember one time I was having a particularly tough day. Uh, since I already talked about this, I might as well just dive in again. But remember I mentioned the stomach flu? Mm -hmm. So my mom visited, and she didn't feel well. And there ended up being a big cleanup. And I was down on my hands and knees. It wasn't what I wanted to be doing this morning. I had other things I needed to do. But there I was on my hands and my knees, and I was cleaning. And um, I had, earlier that day, pointed out the, the noise of a red cardinal to my husband, because I love red cardinals. And to me, they're always, you're nodding your head, you love red cardinals. They're, to me, they're a nod from the Lord, like, I see you. And here I was, I was on my hands and knees, and I was, I was cleaning up, and I looked out the window, and I saw a red cardinal right in that moment, and I heard the Lord say in my heart, I see you. I see what you're doing. In these moments when we are giving of ourselves, especially in the doing things we don't feel like doing, or things that are particularly more challenging, the Lord sees us. He knows us. He has a particular love for us. 
Anyone in here have more than one kid? Raise your hand if you have more than one kid. Do you remember the moment when you were pregnant with your second and you panicked? Why did you panic? Do you remember? I just didn't think I was ready. Yeah, you didn't think you were ready. What else? Why did you panic, Tannis? I just the overwhelming knowledge of what I already knew for that first one. For that first one? I, got, I can't do it again. Go ahead. I remember just thinking, like, how can I love this baby inside me as much as I yes. love my daughter? Yes. That's what I was talking about. And you had that look on your face like, oh, how in the world am I going to love this second baby as much as I love this first baby? What ended up happening? <laughs> Again, love by its very nature, it wants to expand. The more people you bring into love, love doesn't get less, love gets more, right? This is God's particular love for every single human being, right? So this is my body, this is, this is. Each one of us have a unique, marvelous, incredible gift that the Lord has chosen to place in the earth. Have you ever, um, I think I have a, yeah, I have this quote, or this image. What's this moment? The moment when a unique, unrepeatable human being is about to begin. It's stunning to think about this. Do you know what the chances are that you exist? Do you know what, the, anyone know? Anyone look this up? One in 400 trillion. One in 400 trillion. They calculate it based on, okay, like, first of all, in this moment, anyone know how many millions of sperm there are? A ton. <laughs> A ton. Millions, millions. It's somewhere between, like, 250 million, okay? And then there's only one egg, but yet the timing of that one egg and that particular cycle of that particular woman at that particular time, stunning, right? And then the likelihood of two people meeting out of the 7.5 billion possible combinations in the world, whatever. Um, and then, but then take this into account. You remove any one of your grandparents meeting or your great grandparents meeting or your great, 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 and then everything changes. So it's impossible that you're here, <laughs> right? And yet you are. That should just amaze us. Every single human life is amazing. When sperm and egg meet, when two people have sexual intercourse and sperm and egg meet, something hasn't gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Something's gone incredibly, beautifully, miraculously right. And that little life that is beginning is going to live forever with God. And because every single human life is sacred, sexual union is sacred, right? It's a sacred act. Okay, I have a little video to drive this point home. God is love. And what is love music? When you have six, it creates. So love creates space and time. Love overdid it, like love often overdoes things. To have all this be the stage where we meet it, and love put us at the center of space and time. Me at the center of this? I'm so small. Yeah, you are, physically, spiritually, no, no, no. The mountain behind me cannot make a single choice. An ocean cannot love. My little girl just was going to sleep through the night, and she, and she said, why does the devil hate us? And I just said the first thing that came to mind. I said, I think it's because the devil hates God, and you look like God. <laughs> and I draw God, she said, I look like God. <laughs> And as you said that, it struck me in a new way. Yes, you do. You made the image and likeness of God. We repeat these phrases till they mean nothing to us. Could you think about this for a second? You were made the image and likeness of God. And when all this fades away, you'll still be around. You have a soul. You have an immaterial part of you that goes beyond all this. And again, this is a, one of those many things that more and more scientific research is pointing to this reality. Near-death experiences have been talked about throughout history. Now we document what happened with some of the dogs. Very carefully. And not everybody has one of these, but of those who have it and come back, the stories are mind-blowing. Did you know that 80% of the people who are born blind, who have a near-death experience, come back, 80% of them vividly describe sight for the first time. Comparative color analysis, all sorts of things they wouldn't be able to describe unless they had seen it. That can't happen. 
unless there's something else going on about us. Uh -huh. Man, it's incredible. Mm. Okay, so what struck you from the video? What stood out? Did you know that about near-death experiences that they could describe sight? Pretty amazing, isn't it? So human beings are both body and soul, soul right? Yeah. We don't we don't just like we we don't just have bodies. We are bodies, right? We are this unique. What makes us human is that we're this unique combination of body and soul. What about angels? Do angels have bodies? No. No. Angels are pure spirit, right? And even our friend Newman, does he have a? a is he? Ensouled like humans are ensouled? No. no. Can Newman love? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> he can certainly show affection, without a doubt. I got to pet him at the break, and he looked at me, and he came close, and I pet him, and we definitely were feeling a connection, <laughs> Newman and I. But can a dog choose to love and sacrifice for the good of the other like a human being can lay down his life for, the, for another? Not to, the same, not to the same extent, right? Human beings are uniquely created, body and soul, and our souls have intelligence and freedom, and they give us the ability to choose to love, to learn to love like God loves. So this is the theology of the body kind of in a slide talking about the eternal exchange of divine love united with the um, eternal exchange of human love um, brought together in the mystery of God becoming flesh. So Christ is the bridge, right, between divinity and humanity. And it's revealed in and through the body, the body of humanity, the body of Christ. Okay, so again, we're moving through this quote. This is my body. <coughs> What gives any of us the ability to say, my body? Because we have a self-awareness, right? We know that this is my body and not Kathleen's body, right? And we know that um, we're aware of our body um, gifts and our limitations. The things we love about our bodies and the things we want to change about our bodies. I have a little video to show um, about this very idea of our bodies. Um, so they went and they asked 50 people um, what they would like to change about their body. And the answers about the, from the adults are very interesting, but then you'll get in the second half of the video the answers that the children give. And listen closely, because I probably should have turned the captions on. It's hard to hear, but, um, but anyways, uh, sometimes we forget about how good our bodies are. We get all wrapped up in whether our bodies measure up. Has anyone ever, ever here thought, oh, if my body only did this, or if my body only looked like that? Um, anyways, here's a quick video to play this out. Yeah, they have one. 
porque muchos dos caminan derecho y con que mi pie está un poco chueco. When I was younger, I felt like I wasn't quite adequate enough. Can you sit on the chair? <laughs> One question. What's the question? If you could change one thing about your body, what would you change? Mm. Um, hmm. <laughs> um, you know, have a mermaid tail. Mermaid tail. Shark mouth. Shark mouth. <laughs> Tele teleportation. Yeah. I want legs that can see the sweat and run faster. <laughs> I could have wings, like fly under the night and chase. I'd like to fly, actually. Do you love that girl? Just a mermaid tail. Oh, you guys, what was your heart doing when those people were uh, saying things they wanted to change? Mm -hmm. Didn't you want to just like hug them and say, your forehead's perfect. <laughs> and your ears are fine. Oh my gosh. You're beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. And the things that they pointed out were things that we wouldn't have seen. No, we wouldn't have seen them. And how about the way the kids hear those stories? What would you want? I would want wings, and I would want to fly, and I would want a mermaid tail, and I would want to, oh, what a different way of looking at the body. I remember watching an Oprah show on this topic of body image, and she had three young girls on. The first girl refused every, um, any dessert. The second girl would change her clothes 10 times every morning, and the third girl thought she was like horribly ugly, and she had like a modeling portfolio, whatever. And you would see these three girls, and you're like, what is the mom saying to these girls like that they're having these issues? And then they cut to the moms, and the moms are saying all the right things. They're like, I tell her to eat breakfast. I tell her her outfit's cute. I tell her, you know, she's beautiful. But what was the, what was the issue? The mom wouldn't eat dessert. Oh. The mom would change her clothes 15 minutes, mm. um, 15 times every morning. The mom would say, my daughter's so beautiful, but I'm so ugly. I remember when I saw the show, I have four daughters. My, I called my friend Kelly immediately, who has $3. I'm like, Kelly, we can't just tell our daughters that they're beautiful. I'm like, we have to look in the mirror and say to ourselves, we're beautiful. And only in doing that do we give our kids the gift of being happy in our bodies. It's a lot harder, isn't it? But we have to do it. Go home tonight, stand naked in front of the mirror and say, behold, it is very beautiful. <laughs> Sound good? No? <laughs> no, but at some level, what really matters, what, what is the purpose of the body? What's the purpose of the body? Show love, right? Show love to the world. That's how we should measure our bodies. Is my body bringing love to the world? Rather than all these other crazy ways, you know? Don't you love the picture of my son? In the glory of his body, my daughters are like, Mom, you show that picture at your class? <laughs> Sam? He doesn't have clothes on, Mom. That's not OK. I'm like, yes, it is. It's good. It's beautiful. It's good. Like, Oh, the sweet little baby's body. We have a newborn back here, two month old, right? Patrick. Yeah. How beautiful to revel in the beauty of God's given design of his body, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's read this quote. Someone nice and loud is willing. Go ahead, Tannis. In our bodies, we are a mere speck in a vast creative universe. But by virtue of our soul, we transcend the whole material world. I invite you to reflect on what makes each one of you truly marvelous and unique. Pause. Will you go home and do that? Will you go home and, and say, Lord, what makes me marvelous and unique? And, and write it down. 
and spend some time journaling on it. Go ahead. Only a human being like you can think and speak and share your thoughts in, a different, in different languages with other human beings all over the world. And through that language, express the beauty of art and poetry and music and literature and the theater and so many other uniquely human accomplishments. And most important of all, only God's precious human beings are capable of loving. OK, so tell your kids. Tell your kids, especially if you have a lot of kids. This is what makes you unique. This is the gift that you have. God's given you this especially for you to bring to the world. And it's revealed in and through our very bodies. You want to hear a crazy story? At St. Hilary, I taught a class. And there was a girl in the classroom that had um, uh, a half of her arm, 10 minutes, okay, half of her arm on one and half of her leg on the other. And I'm talking about the goodness and the beauty of the body and how it's created. And, and then when we talk later on about um, in heaven, in the second coming, there'll be a resurrection of the body and the, the deaf will hear and the lame will walk and the blind will see and all that, you know, and everything will be restored. This little girl raised her hand. She's like, well, what if we like our bodies like they are? She's like, I've always been told that my body is a gift and God gave it to me for a reason to share his love to the world in a unique way that I only, only I can. And then I went home and I'm like, I don't know the answer to this. Like, isn't everything, like, again, everything that's not as it should be to be restored? And you know what I found out? I found out in Dr. Peter Crave's book that um, you actually somehow get to, like, pick. The, he, he says that there's something to, like, your resurrected body like some of the saints kept the things that made them saintly in their resurrected bodies. Like there's this one story of this, this woman that like, like loved her husband, loved her husband, stayed up late, worried about her husband. And like her resurrected in her saintly body, she had like dark circles or something like that. This is the example he used in the book. Um, and so we see Jesus, well what do we see in, resurrect, in Jesus' resurrected body? We see the wounds, okay? So I don't know what our resurrected bodies exactly will be like, but maybe they'll have like little glimpses of what made us loving, right? Even if they're not like perfected bodies, I don't know. I don't know, I'm still holding out thinking I'm gonna have a perfect body. But, <laughs> but to think about this, this idea of our particular bodies created by God for a reason is beautiful to reflect on. <clears throat> okay. This point real quick, given up. Why is this an important part of this line? This is my body given up. Why did something have to be given up? What is it about the story of our salvation history that something needed sacrificed or given up? What did we do? Sin, right? Because of sin, there needs to be a restoring of what was lost, right? And so that's why there needs to be a giving, a sacrifice, an offering. And this is what Christ did for us. So because of the fall, with just briefly, what is the fall? The fall is basically where we didn't trust God. God had said, I'll give you everything. Free reign of the garden and and, you know, man and woman loving and giving and receiving love. That was the original plan. But we didn't trust God. We went and we did what we thought was best for us. And this is the original sin. And I'll tell you, it's the same today as it's ever been. Anytime I think I know better than God, I'm falling back into this trap of the original sin. And so with this rupture... Now that there is the man and the woman are no longer naked without shame. But this is the reason that God came. He lived, he died, he suffered. I'm sorry, he lived, he suffered, he died. He rose to restore everything that fell apart. So here's the quote I have on this. It's uh, the third one there in your, in your um, handout. It is in the Eucharist that the Son who is one being with the Father, offers himself in sacrifice to the Father for humanity and for all of creation. In the Eucharist, Christ gives back to the Father everything that has come from him. Thus, there is brought about 
a profound mystery of justice on the part of the creature towards the creator. Again, all the rupture is restored. Um, okay, man needs to honor his creator by offering a, to him in an act of thanksgiving and praise all that he received. Man must no, never lose sight of this debt, which he alone, among all the other earthly realities, is capable of acknowledging and paying back as the one creator made in God's own image and likeness. So we are the ones that can really offer this back. At the same time, given his creaturely limitations and sinful condition, we are incapable of making this act of justice towards the creator. Had not Christ himself, the one, the son, who was one being with the father and also true man, first given us the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the center of everything. Again, the Eucharist is, is where we came from, where we're headed, the very meaning of our life. It is the mystery that orients everything about, about this whole story of salvation. So it's only because of the Eucharist can we participate fully in this redemption, right? Anyone um, have anything that they don't love about this world? <laughs> Give me one. What don't you love about this world other than stomach flu? What else? Or what? War. Violence. Yeah. War. The news. The news. Cancer. Cancer. TikTok. <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> yeah. You guys, we live in a hard world. We live in a horrible, difficult world. There's accidents, there's disease, there's broken relationships, there's addiction. It's not easy. And yet, somehow, through it all, God is working out redemption. And not only that, but he has invited us to participate in the redemption. Has anyone in here ever gone through something really, really hard and something good has come from it? What's that mystery called? The, anyone know? Get a bonus point if you get it right. It starts with a P. The... Paschal. You guys got that, right? Who knew it? Who knew it? The Paschal mystery. That, that in the dying is followed by the rising, right? That when we unite our suffering with Christ, good will come from it. And how do we know that to be true? Because of the resurrection. And so every single little mystery in our lives of suffering, if we unite it with Christ, God can bring good from it. Okay, so to wrap things up, um, how much time do I have? You've got five minutes. Five minutes. Or less. less. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you guys remember, how did they tell Jesus was dead on the cross? What did the, what did the soldier do? He pierced the side, right? And when he pierced the side, what poured out? The water and the blood. And sacramentally, the water represents baptism, and the blood represents the Eucharist. So this in Mary at the foot of the cross represents the church. And this is in some ways seen as the beginning of the sacramental life of our church, right? And when we see something coming from the side, that should remind us of what else came from the side. Eve, right? So I put this slide up to recognize this idea of there's something so mysterious about the, the mystery of creation, male and female created for love. And life comes from this love and the mystery of redemption. Because of the fall, we need to restore that's lost. And this happens when the new Adam and the new Eve give their yes to God. And then um, all of the brokenness is brought to healing and wholeness and back in union with God and with each other. Does that make sense? You with me? Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, so to wrap this up, this, this is my body given up for you. Why for you? Why for you? Because it's always about communion, isn't it? It's never about isolation. It's never about just solitude. 
In fact, it wasn't good for the man to be alone because we're made for love. We're made for love with God and with each other. And just like when little Patrick came into the world, he's like opening his eyes and he's looking around because he knows he can't do it on his own, right? And that's why mom realized she can't do it on her own. She needs dad and dad needs mom and mom needs dad and they need everyone. They need a community around them of learning how to love. And right away, this little baby is looking for clues like, who am I? Why am I here? What's going on? How can you get, who's the one that gives me what I need, right? This is life. Life is about communion. It's what we're made for. I have a cute little video to make this point. Mm. Hi, Dad. Sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, sure, let's, let's do that then. That, that video, I've seen it 50 times, I still teared up. Why did I tear up? Because of the great lengths a daughter went to to spend time with her dad, right? What are the great lengths that we go to to be able to spend time with each other, giving and receiving of love? It's such a beautiful, what, what song's playing in the background? I love, you know? Why does love matter so much? Because love is where we came from. Love is the purpose of our lives. And love is what we're destined for. Eternal union with God and with each other. So last quote, the bottom of your page. John Paul II said this quote um, uh, is from this book, The Five Loves. I love this. The Eucharist is the secret of my day. It gives me strength and meaning to all of my activities as I, and the activities I serve the church and the world. So here's, it, here's it, his advice to us. Let Jesus and the blessed sacrament speak to your heart. It is he who is the true answer of life that you seek. He stays here with us. He is God with us. Seek him without tiring. Welcome him without reserve. Love him without interruption. Today, tomorrow, and forever. Good advice. Good advice. So my final thing I have to say, I mentioned this story about the windows. I was trying to put in words uh, to this woman who got me my windows, how awesome they, my windows look and how warmer my house is and you can't hear the turnpike and all that stuff like that. I'm trying to say thank you and I said, really, I can't put this into words. Here's what she texted back to me. Your happiness is mine. I know for sure I'm not as generous as she is, <laughs> but is that true? 
that your happiness is mine. Isn't it true? It's true for her, for me, for all of us. All of us know that if we're all united to God with each other, that we're all bonded. It's what life is about, and it can be true that our happiness is all linked. So what really will make us happy is saying to the Lord, this is my body given up for you too, right? Okay.